How many of you remember the days of going back to school? You remember the back FR? You know, it's kind of amazing how uh, those in school and high schools and colleges kind of set the tone for our whole, whole culture, and yet how out of touch a lot of them are with, with the uh, realities of day-to-day -day life. Um, in fact, uh, I would like a summer vacation. Anybody else would like a summer vacation? They complain that the summer vacation is too short. Um, the other day I was uh, talking to a, a parent and their uh, student is about three years into college now, so they've gotten kind of beyond the point where they're through the normal classes and they're into the, what they call the practicum. So they're, they're in, in sessions that begin to prepare them for what their jobs are actually going to be like. And so uh, she was saying, man, we were in the same thing for about three or four hours, just sitting there doing the same thing all day. And I'm like, dude, well, that's what most of us call a job, okay? Why well, is you sit in the same cubicle for, for eight hours? And, uh, but, you know, it's, a, it's an exciting time. And I find that most people uh, probably are excited to get back to school. I think the older ones more so to see their friends. Some of the middle grades, kind of a bummer. But the older ones and the younger ones especially. I think the youngest ones are the most excited to get back into school. You know, they've not got all the pressures of competition that's set in yet. All the activities and, you know, somebody does better in school than they do. So they're just kind of looking forward to it. And there's some that are a little apprehensive. But most of those little ones that go into preschool and to kindergarten, you know, they're really anxious to go. I came across a story about, uh, I think it was a preschool student, and, and um, uh, they were in their class there. Of course, nothing too heavy, you know. They've got uh, play time and uh, naps and all that kind of stuff. But they're, they're drawing pictures, and uh, uh, they could draw anything they wanted to. So the teacher's kind of going around and looking at the, the things that they're doing, kind of trying to figure them out. So she comes to one little guy, and she can't quite figure out what he's doing, but it's kind of interesting. She said, well, uh, Timmy, what are you drawing there? And he says, I'm drawing a picture of God. She says, well, man, that's something. But I'm, I'm not sure anybody really knows what God looks like. And without skipping a beat, Timmy says, well, they will in just a minute. <laughs> now, I kind of want to talk tonight about uh, maybe not so much just what God looks like, but what his people should look like, what we in the church would look like, because how we look affects most people out there, their impression of God. So that's very critical. So I want to talk about that. But I want to start out by being uh, pretty blunt with you and just ask you, why are you here tonight? Why are you, why are you here? Why do we come together at a time like this? What are we expecting to happen? What, what do we want to see from, from this time that we, we spend these few moments together? Well, let me ask it this way. What would cause you to leave this place saying, wow, now that was church? Any of, any of you ever said that when, when you've left? I hope you've maybe said that a, a time or so, that you walked there and said, man, now that was church. What type of things would have been going on to make you feel that way? I think probably for each of us, it might be something a little different. Some of you, it might be uh, dynamic preaching. For others, it might be some uh, soul-stirring worship. Or, or others, it might be uh, special music or some inspirational presentation. Or, or even a, a refreshing time at the altar. And those things might cause you to leave saying, wow, that was church. But was it? Is that church? All those things can be important, but what I want to get across tonight is the fact that church is not just what happens in this building. Church isn't what happens across the street or in the classrooms upstairs or here and there. That's part of it if we're honest, and that's the impression that we kind of leave with a lot of times is that we've been to church. But church is, is more than what happens in this room. Church is more than what you hear from the, uh, the pastor going out from here. Church is more than what you see up there or here coming out of there. It's more than any of the stuff we see going on up here. Those are some of the things that we make judgments about to say if, if we really felt that that was a great time in God's presence. But that's not the church. The church isn't a matter of all that stuff. The church is what's going on in here. And the church is what's going on here and here. Because the church is not a place. The church is people. The church is, is not a building. It's a, it's a body of believers. And when, when, when Jesus said that, uh, when God says that his presence would dwell within us and, and that he created for himself a resting place, it's not in, in buildings made with human hands. The place he wants to work through is the human hands. 
And when he says that he would build his church, he's not talking about a structure. He's talking about a body of believers who know and love him, and that's who he's going to work through, and the gates of hell are not going to be able to stand up uh, against our advance. Because that's the church. And it's nice when things are happening in this place, and we see evidence of the, the power and the presence of God, but if God is really having his way in this place, and in this place then it's going to show out there in the other places of life where it really needs to be evident that God is at work. And when that doesn't happen, what do we call a time like that? What do we call a time when, when whether it's among God's people or the church as a whole, and sometimes these times go on for a long time throughout the history of the church. There are times when, when people have just been spiritually dry, and the church is, you might even describe it as dead and lifeless, and it's not having the effect it should. What, what term do we use to describe what the church needs at a time like that? Revival. Awakening. Renewal. All kinds of things you, you might, you might uh, give the terminology to. And I'm going to be honest with you. I, I, I don't shy away from that notion. I've even talked and preached on that before at times, and we need to be revived. But I'm not entirely comfortable with the notion either, mainly because I don't want to think that we're always in the state where we need to be revived. But it's not hard to look around the culture right now and understand that, that we're living in a society that needs spiritual renewal and spiritual refreshing. But it's got to start with us here. And when it, when it begins to take place, how do we know that it's happening? How do we know that something is in revival? or renew? How do we know that a church is alive and on fire? What kinds of things? I just, just think about that for a second. I want you to shout some of those things out to me. What are some things that are going on in a church uh, if it's experiencing that kind of life or revival or renewal or it's a church that's alive? What kind of things are going on? People are being saved. People coming. Healings. Miracles. What else? Testimonies. Testimonies. People talking about what God's doing. Dependence on God. Look through the ages. You'll see a renewed hunger for holiness. It begins to pervade all of the community. People don't even know God. Beginning to come under uh, conviction that, that something in their life isn't right. Those are all evidences of what we would call Revival. And I want to take you to a place tonight where all of those things are going on. And where do you think that place might be? Where do we, where do we really need to look when we want to see a model of how church should look if it's really, on, really alive and on fire? We look to the Word, don't we? Now, it's amazing how many churches these days, that's... that's I'll be honest, it's not necessarily the first place they look, but one of the places, but they're looking to other churches that are doing things bigger and better than we are. And that's kind of what we emulate to try to connect with people and to see something significant in our communities. That's never been God's priority. That's never been the place that, that he puts the most stock on. So I want to look to the Word tonight, the book of Acts, and get there with me. I want to see what's going on in a church where all the things that we just mentioned were happening... Uh, all together and in, and in pretty large measure. And I want to look not only at the things that were going on, but I want to look at the context in which they're happening because revival is not just a, a, an event. It's really an environment where things are going on and God is working through people that can begin to change and affect their society. So I want to look at the things that are going on, but I want to see in the atmosphere in which those things are happening. So get to Acts chapter 2. I want to get there in just a second, but keep this in mind. You see throughout the book of Acts a lot of very ordinary people who are experiencing and doing some pretty extraordinary things. But if you look a little closer, you're going to see a lot of ordinary people doing a lot of pretty ordinary things. Because a lot of times it's the simple, practical disciplines by which we begin to see some powerful spiritual things happen. And that's what we see in the book of Acts. Now remember when we talk about the book of Acts, we're not talking about a church that needs to be revived or come to life. This is where it all starts. This is how the church came to life in the first place. And that's what we need to emulate. So I want to look at Acts chapter 2. Beginning in verse number 42, I, I want to look at how it all began and where it started because that's the way it really should continue today. 
And it says in Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse number 42, this is right on the heels of, of Peter's sermon at Pentecost and a lot of people being saved. And now it's describing how things carried on. And it says this. It says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles, and all believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need, and every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Now, I want you to keep, keep your, your Bibles, your device open to that passage because I want to look at some things. That's basically the outline. You probably wouldn't even need much of this. Kind of put a bunch of that up there at the last moment to have something to look at if you wanted. But I want you to keep your nose in the scripture there and look back at some of the things that were going on in that early church ministry that we maybe talked about just a second ago. It says in verse number 43 that they were filled with awe over the things that were happening. Now, I'd say if we walked out of here filled with awe at what took place, we'd probably say, well, that was church. In fact, if we were in awe of things that was going on out there because of God was working through our lives, we'd really know something was going on. And it goes on to say after that, uh, some of the reason they were in awe, it says that, uh, that uh, uh, th it talks about signs and wonders. Now, we don't seek signs and wonders, but the Bible says that signs would follow those that believe. It also says that he would confirm his word with signs following. So when things are going on, there's going to be signs and wonders. And I can guarantee if there were signs and wonders and miracles, and, and, and I'm talking about real, uh, documented uh, things going on that we can point to and say, that can't happen in the natural, we'd say, uh, that's church. When that stuff is going on. That's what was going on in the book of Acts. Well, it goes on to say uh, in, in verse number 47 that the church enjoyed the favor of all the people. You know, if we start gaining favor with people in our community, in our society, places outside of here, in our schools, in our workplaces, and, and sometimes you can kind of garner that type of favor when you compromise the message, and you com but I'm talking if we're not compromising anything, and we're standing for truth, and we're being bold with it, and we still are gaining favor out there, then we, we know God's up to something. God's doing something in our community. That's going on in the book of Acts. In fact, in, in chapter 5, 13, it says something similar. It, it says that uh, no one else dared to join them, even though they were highly regarded by the people. That was kind of curious to me because it talks about the favor they had. But then when it said that, that some people were, were kind of hesitant or afraid to join them. So I said, what's going on there? Well, I think what that's talking about is how stark of a contrast there was between what was going on in the church and what was going on in the rest of the culture. And people looking in could see that difference. And that really speaks to an environment of holiness. Of people who were set apart for a different purpose. Of people who weren't just doing the common, uh, ordinary, uh, mundane things of life. But they were set apart for those special purposes. And it was obvious to the world that there was a difference there. And I'll just say this. If there's not a difference in what's going on in our lives, what does the world need with our message? What reason would they need to change it for doing it the same? But in the New Testament church, they saw a difference. And that difference was an attraction to some. It caused apprehension in others, but there was definitely a difference. And because of that difference, they were changing their culture. And this was a culture that, by and large, was, was rejecting the message, was hostile to what was going on with the church. And very soon after this, they would be scattered here and there. But they were changing that world because of the dynamic and the simple disciplines that were going on in that New Testament church. And all these things that we, that we look at and we would deem as, as signs of genuine and true revival, all of those things were going on in that community in the New Testament church. And they were growing. It says that, in fact, the biggest thing of all, it says the Lord was adding to the number daily those who were being saved. I tell you, if we were seeing people come to the Lord daily, for one thing, that would mean it isn't just happening here in a Sunday or a Wednesday or Wednesday night. He was doing that on a continual basis. That's church. That's what's supposed to be going on. And all of these things were happening uh, in that environment in the book of Acts. So I want to look at the environment that those things were taking place in. Those are some of the outward results that we see. And we would say, that's church. That's a church alive. That's a church on fire. But how did they get there? 
Because a lot of the time, as I said, uh, the most practical, sometimes simple disciplines are the thing that yield the greatest spiritual results when we apply ourselves to those things. So I want to look at the things that the New Testament church applied themselves to by which they saw all these great things. And I want to make a couple practical applications to how we carry on our ministry today. The first thing it says that they devoted themselves to is the apostles' teaching. Now, what was the apostles' teaching? That's a pretty broad statement to say the apostles' teaching. Well, well one thing, I, I'm certain that it, that it was a good part of what Jesus was sharing with his, his disciples as they followed him. So a lot of it was probably what was going on in the Gospels. They were simply talking about their experience with Jesus. But Jesus also talks in Luke chapter 24. He tells them later what their message was to be. And he said that after he suffered and after he died, he would rise again from the dead and, and forgiveness and new life would be preached in his name. And that was basically the message it carried on because if you look in Acts chapter 2, that's what Peter was talking about uh, in his message. That this same Jesus who you put to death, uh, God raised him from the dead and now forgiveness is available uh, through his life. And you go into Acts chapter 3 and you see them talking about the prophecy where Jesus would suffer and be raised from the dead with the power to heal and bring freedom. And in Acts chapter 4, it goes on into more of the same thing when it's talking about the resurrection of Jesus and the fact that they would testify to the things that were made available through him. And, and I could talk about evangelism and sharing our faith and all those things, but I want to get to a more basic level of what it means uh, to testify or bear witness. And, and Jeff talked about that this morning when he talked about testifying, sitting around the table and talking about the things that go on in life and the memories those bring back. And that's what a large part of that involves. Because when you are a, a, a testify or you are a witness, like even in court, what are, you, what are you doing? You're simply giving your side of the story. You're simply telling about your experience with the situation. And that's what was going on in the New Testament church is they were simply talking about their experience with Jesus. Now, that isn't something, to be honest, that everybody gets the chance to do when we come together on a Sunday. Every once in a while we take testimonies, or you may be teaching or speaking in some. But this isn't the context where that goes on in a large part. It may in some of the classes you'll take part in, or smaller groups that are maybe set up to be a little more interactive. But what's the primary context where we should be talking about what Jesus is doing in our own lives? What, what are the places that we can kind of practice doing that so when it comes to sharing it with people who don't know him, we become more accustomed to doing it? What kind of environment is, is happening there? Well, it's times when we come together outside of this place. And we're in each other's homes. Or we're going out to eat together. Or we're just hanging out. And the conversation centers on more than just maybe what's happening and what we're watching, what we're looking at. But it's always on our mind of what God is doing. And we just start to talk about those things in other contexts outside of here. And that's kind of practice for talking about it with people who don't yet know Him. But the prime context for testifying and being a witness to what Jesus is doing in your life and sharing your own experience is not what happens in the church here. It happens in how we carry on conversations in our daily life. That's where it needs to be taking place. And that kind of brings me to the second thing there, because they were coming together, and it says that they devoted themselves to the fellowship. They were committed to each other. The text talks about they were coming together daily. Now, how many, how many of you could handle that? Coming together with some people in here daily, all right? I don't know, some of you might not want to get with me daily. Some of you got four emails and letters from me in the last uh, uh, five days, and, and so uh, you're going to call the church and get off that list because you don't want me in your face that often, all right? But they were together daily, and they loved it. They, they, they thrived on that, that, that unity, and a healthy church ministry is one that builds relationship with God, brings people into relationship with God. That's the apostles' teaching. And it brings us into relationship with each other. That's the fellowship. And when that's going on, you look at the book of Acts and all the powerful things that are happening, the gifts and ministry flourishing, and God at work in powerful ways. But the underlying context of all that is an atmosphere of unity and togetherness. That's how the church started. Uh, when, the, when the Holy Spirit was poured out, it says they were all in one place, in one accord. The passage we're looking at right now in Acts chapter 2, there was that, uh, that atmosphere of unity. And Acts chapter 4 talks about the same thing. And they lived and shared and had everything in common. Nobody had need because they were all there for each other. And it was that atmosphere of unity, not only that the church started in, but continued in. 
Psalm 133 is a passage that really speaks to, to unity, and it says how good and precious it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. And then it goes on to say, uh, it says that's like the dew that uh, was on Mount Zion or M Mount Hermon, another name for it. And that was a place where God poured out his blessing. Because unity is, is a place that refreshes and prepares us for blessing. And then it says that unity is like the, the oil that was poured out over Aaron that saturated his, his hair and his beard and ran down into his garments. What did that oil represent? What do we call that when they poured oil over somebody like that? We, the anointing. And we talk about things like in a revivalistic context, a man, that was really anointed. Or the anointing is among that. And we're talking about something powerful. And the Bible tells us in that passage that that atmosphere of anointing is one of unity. It doesn't mean that, that whenever we come together for some uh, purpose, you know, maybe some harebrained purpose that there's going to be anointing. But it definitely means that, that if we're not in unity, that the anointing is going to be absent. Jesus in John chapter 17, shortly before uh, that he was taken away and crucified, prays for his followers, including us, those who would follow him. And he, and he prays four times, four or five times in that prayer. He says that they may be one as you and I are one because he understood the, the, the prominence and the importance of unity in confirming his message and the fact that coming together built in that, that boldness and that encouragement that they would need to keep spreading his message because they were devoted to the fellowship. And where does fellowship happen? What context is most conducive to fellowship? Now, we had a good time last week here. We had a great time of fellowship out there. It, the, the church, people have described the, the church, the purpose of the church in four ways over the ages. Uh, they said that the purposes are worship, fellowship, discipleship, and evangelism. And I'll be honest, out of all of those, maybe kind of the, the, the most light one seems like you know, fellowship. That isn't quite as deep as the other thing. But none of the others can happen if we're not in fellowship. If we're not coming together here. So last week we had a time like that. And we enjoyed ourselves, had a good time, did some unusual things, had some fun. And I, and I can tell you, maybe it was just me, but it seemed like people were more ready and free in their worship. It seemed like they were more receptive to the word. They were enjoying each other's company and having a great time because they were in fellowship with one another. And out of that context of fellowship... God, it, it just opens a door for great things to happen. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship. And that kind of ties into the third thing it mentions. It says that they were devoted to the breaking of bread. Now, what does it mean to break bread? What were they doing? They were going, they were going to eat together. They were in their homes or they were somewhere else. But they were breaking bread. They were sharing a meal. Now, we like to do that, but I'm going to be honest with you. For us, that, that sometimes isn't quite as big a deal because we can go out and get fast food and it, there's not much to it. But in ancient cultures, and the further back you go, the more so this is true, uh, the, the meal, the gathering, the preparation, the sitting down to it, uh, that was a good part of their day doing that kind of activity. And so when it's talking about that they broke bread together, uh, really it implies more than just them having a meal. It really implies how they were sharing their, their entire lives. They were sharing much more of their lives than just that meal when they sat down with each other. They were getting to know each other. They, they were going back. And in fact, it even talks about that sharing as you get a little further into there. Uh, and that's where it says that all believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. That spirit of generosity... And God blessed that and did powerful things in it because that really expressed his character. And when that's going on, man, that opens doors. That opens people's heart to the message that we have. When we're out there, not with an agenda that we're trying to get something across to them, but we're meeting needs, we're being kind and compassionate and generous. And that's what was going on in the early church when they were with each other, breaking bread. Now, where's the context when that happens? The same thing we've been talking about. When we go out of here, when we sit around the table with each other, we sit across the living room, we begin to share each other's lives. And as some people have described, they do life together. They're coming together in other contexts where they can talk about their experience with Jesus, what he's doing in their life, where they can share fellowship, where they can get to know each other, get to know their families, know what's going on in people's lives. That's the context that God begins to stir us to do some powerful things. That's the times when the world can look on us and know that we're his followers because of the love that we have for each other. And it perks their ears up to the message as well. They voted themselves to the breaking of bread. And the last thing it mentions is that they were devoted to prayer. 
They saw that Jesus was the center of everything that was going on. Now, I don't have time in the few moments I'm going to close here uh, to unpack the issue of prayer. But just to say that those, that those early believers understood that Jesus and their relationship with him is at the center of everything. And there was nothing of daily significance that happened uh, significant apart from prayer. There was nothing of eternal significance. There was nothing really of any significance that happened in their lives apart from prayer. Now, this house should be a house of prayer. But I can tell you, this isn't the primary context where prayer needs to be going on because if we rely on what goes on here to sustain our lives in that respect, we're not going to make it very far. We're not going to be like Pastor Jess Lawnmore. We can't go without that spiritual gas. We need to be in prayer all the time. But the prayer it's talking about here isn't just that. It is talking about coming together and praying together. But we don't get that chance as, as here as much as, as we could outside of here when we get together. And we spend time with each other. And you're with people who have gotten to know you. And so those prayers are more effective because their heart is with you. And you know what's going on in their lives. You can come out of, in and out of here pretty easily. And I'll be honest. Uh, you, you can hide what's going on. Or maybe you're not trying to hide it. But just for other people to see. And you can go in and out with the same needs. And nobody may ever realize what's really going on. But when you're sitting there in the living room with somebody or across the dinner table with somebody, or you're hanging out in a small group, it's a little tougher to go along and to, and to feel that you've been left alone with your need. And it's a little easier to be open with these aspects of life and to pour yourself out and to share that need in that group that knows you and their heart is with you. Because that's the context where it needs to be happening. That's the context where you really begin to see, like Pastor Austin preached last week, that we're all in this together. How has the church survived its most difficult times throughout history? How has it survived persecution and, and, and being forced underground in parts of the world that know that in ways that we, that we may never know that? How does it survive? It survives from house to house. In China right now, I've been a part of producing resources that have got over to China in a lot of different contexts. They're not produced for the church like this. They're produced for the house church. And faith is exploding over there because it's happening house to house. And they're following the example that early believers who did these simple practical things. And we can do the same things today. And yeah, we want to have church when we're here. We want to get, and, and what happens here is a great and significant part of our lives. But I'm telling you, the part where it really begins to hit the road is when we take it out of here and we become the church in places that maybe don't look like this. They look a little more commonplace, but we get with people. We talk about what Jesus is doing. We share the fellowship. We break bread. We pray together. And when that's going on, like it was in the New Testament church, I'm telling you, God is going to begin to do things not just in here, but out there. And when it happens out there, then we know something's going on. Then maybe we're not the only ones that's saying, now this is church. Maybe some people out there can look on and say, man, maybe, maybe that's church. Maybe that's what's supposed to be happening. Maybe that's what I need to be a part of as well. And that's what I want us to think about tonight. We're a relational church. Relationships are in our DNA. We, we talk ab about that a lot. Somebody approached Pastor Weaver a while back and said, this is the biggest small church they've seen. Because they recognize how key relationships are to this church. But I can tell you this. We've got to have a way to keep staying relational as we continue to reach the lost. And that just doesn't happen automatically. And so in the days ahead, one of the things that we're going to be doing more than ever is we're really going to be uh, beefing up and expanding our small group ministry, our home fellowships, life groups. A lot of people call them a lot of different things. And we're going to be broadening that ministry because we see the importance of staying connected as we continue to reach people. This morning the, the house was packed. And I know Pastor Weaver don't always like to put in emphasis on growing because he never wanted to get huge. But if you're doing things, you're going to, people are going to be coming. And we've got to stay in relationship with them. And it's not going to happen in this big context very easily. We've got to find that way to, to maintain that smallness as we grow. And so we're going to be beefing that up. And in the days ahead, we're going to be launching a lot of small groups. Some of you are going to lead those groups. Some of you may host those groups. Others are just going to attend. And, and that's all good. 
But we're, uh, we're, we're making a, a, a deliberate press to find leadership for these type of groups. And some of you I've been in touch with, and some of you have come and talked to me about it and asked me about things. But I tell you, I don't, I don't know a lot of people here yet. I need to get more and more into the fellowship. So if you're interested in being a part of this in the days ahead, you come and talk to me. You'll be at the top of the list because we need leadership. We need people to open the homes to these type of things. In a couple weeks, uh, we're going to be having, uh, on the 23rd, we're going to be having, and again on the 30th, two nights, the same thing. We're going to be having a no obligation uh, orientation just to talk about the vision for our small group ministry and just some, some reasons and, and practical vision for it. And, and you can come out of there and, and decide whether that may be right for you. And a couple weeks following that, we're going to be having some training that will equip you and resource you to be effective in that. And we're going to be with you every step of the way. Because we're going to make a deliberate effort to make sure that the church is not just going on in here, but out there. And I want to encourage you in some fashion to take part of that. Because there's probably no ministry in the church that more closely resembles what the New Testament looked like than that small group ministry. And I'd love for you to be a part of it. And there are people here waiting to be a part of something like that. And I believe when we start to do more things like that and become involved in that type of ministry, God's going to begin to do some powerful things in our lives like he did in the book of Acts. I'm going to ask the musicians to come up for just a few moments. So all I'm trying to get across is the fact is that church isn't just what happens in this place. Church is what happens out there in the most conducive context to doing the things that we're doing in the New Testament church. It's just when we're getting together and we're sharing life and we're going out to places and we're hanging out and we're spending time with each other's homes and we're enjoying each other's company. And I believe when that happens, God will do some powerful things because that's the church. That's what it needs to look like. So, I hope you've heard some apostolic teaching tonight. I, I, I hope you've had some good fellowship already and maybe yet tonight you're going to have some more. So I'm going to take just a few moments before we close and I'm going to open the altars and if you have, have something that you want to have need of, you can just come up here and stand and we'll pray for you. But I just want to encourage everybody here to spend a few moments in prayer. Maybe you're going to pray about if God wants to use you uh, more directly in our small group ministry as we begin to ramp things up with that. And you can talk to me. We're Dan and Sue. Are Dan and Sue here tonight? Our small group coordinator. Right, right. Give a little wave there, Dan and Sue. You can see them about anything with our small group because they're our lay coordinators for this ministry. And if you get involved, you'll get to know them and you can talk to them as well but uh, I just want to give a few moments and and you may spend time in prayer about that but you got something on your mind there's no sense walking out of here I want to give some time to do that and then I want to challenge you to do this you got time yet tonight to to go out and break bread with somebody find somebody maybe you don't know yet or maybe somebody you've kind of gotten to know and maybe you've even said to them hey we need to get together sometime I've done that before, and you just never make the time. Tonight would be a good time to do that. Go out and break bread. Now they've got kids, they get back to school and all. Man, they'll love this. That, when I grew, I grew up in the church, the times I remember most are the times we did stuff afterwards. I love that. Made an impression on my life. Take your family. Get to know another family. And just spend some time that. I want you to stand with me tonight. And again, I encourage you just to come down. Find a place where you're at. Find a place at this altar. Let God maybe cement a couple things he said to you through this. Maybe let him talk to you about whether he'd want you to be more involved. There's, there's any number of things that can be on your heart, but I want to give time to do, to, to do that. And in the days ahead, we'll get even more time to do that in the contest with, with each other in our homes. But tonight as we, uh, we close, I just want you to begin to come. Find a place, and if you want prayer for, for a need, Come here. We're going to pray for you. Believe that God can do miraculous things. And I want to encourage you after spending a few moments there that maybe you'll take me up on that challenge tonight to find somebody that uh, you're willing to go out with, get to know, break bread, go out, place to find something to eat, and, uh, and spend some time getting to know them because you don't know what kind of relationship can develop from there and what may happen in your life spiritually because you take that time to enjoy their company socially. Lord, I thank you for the time we've had together tonight. And Lord, I just pray that, uh, that somehow in this uh, plain and, and hopefully practical message that something gets across to the, the, the challenge of, of what we need to be like as a church in the days ahead. And Lord, whether or not they take part in a particular ministry is not the issue, but to understand that what happens here is not all there is to church. That's, that's a, a very small part of it. Impactful as it may be, Lord, we know that the church is what happens in our lives out there. 
And Lord, the best context for us to, to, to begin to, to practice and to exercise that is getting together with other believers, talking about you, sharing good times, talking about families, getting to know each other, praying for each other. And Lord, I pray in the days ahead you'll do powerful things in this church because those relationships have been built. And those relationships with each other are some of the things that are going to bring more people into relationship with you. And we'll give you glory for it. We'll pray these things in Jesus' name.